Good evening, everyone. I am trying something a little bit new tonight. I am actually going to be able to share my screen with you a little bit differently. I am looking to make the slides a little bit bigger because we got some feedback that the slides were a little small. And so I'm hoping this will be helpful for you. My name is Kristen DeFrancisco. I'm coming to you remotely from my home and talking with you a little bit tonight about why behavior has a reason. Um, I'm starting off with a quote this evening, beneath every behavior is a feeling and beneath every feeling is a need. And when we meet that need, rather than focus on the behavior, we begin to deal with the cause and not the symptom. And that's from Ashley Warner, and she's a psychologist who writes or contributes to Edutopia. And I thought that was an appropriate way to start out our talk about behavior tonight. Behavior has a reason. Behavior is a way for all humans to communicate and figuring out what a child is trying to communicate through behavior can be one of the hardest jobs for parents and for students. And figuring out what to do in response to the behavior is even harder. On the next slide, you are going to see the five general reasons for behavior and almost all reasons for behavior would fall into these categories. I'll let that hang out there for a second. I won't read the entire thing to you, but the functions of behavior circle around attention, wanting something tangible, wanting to escape, wanting to avoid, or needing some sort of sensory input. And each one of those um, has an example. Um, attention is usually verbalization, a child looking for attention that doesn't get it, access to desired objects, people, places, activities. That's a tangible want. Like a child wants to use the computer, so they pretend their hand hurts when they write so they can actually use the computer instead. Um, a child escaping from an activity or avoiding an activity demonstrates some sort of emotion and sensory. And we talk about ch children bouncing their leg or playing with a fidget or doodling or tapping a pencil. All those behaviors have reason. In the moment, it can be difficult to decide why a child is behaving a certain way. And right now, especially, children's emotions can change from moment to moment. So as teachers in the moment, what we find best is to say things like, you seem really upset right now. Is there something I can do to help? You don't have to stay with me, but I need to know your plan. Can we talk about this when you are not so upset? You are not being safe. You need some time and space. So time and space is actually something we use quite a lot at school and may also be helpful to you at home. Every single classroom at Gibbs has an area of time and space. Kids can choose to use it on their own and it might be requested by a teacher. Setting up a time and space spot in your home might be a great idea for some families. A bedroom is not necessarily a great space because then students may turn that against you. They might say, I'm in time and space and not come out of their bedrooms. Um, an office space, a corner of a room, a den could work. When someone is using that space, it would indicate that others need to give them some time. Items at school in our time and space that, that you might see if you were um, at our school, fidgets, a small speaker for listening to music quietly, mandala or intri intricate coloring pages that keep you engaged and switch your mindset, books to read for a set time, a timer. Remember, this is different than free time. So a timer would be used in time and space. It, it really needs, it, it really is a signifying, I need some time, please leave me alone for a little while. And modeling time and space can be really helpful. So use it. If a child sees you using it, then they're going to know that this is a strategy we use in our space. As you're setting up your expectations around behavior and trying to figure out what behavior means, if you have clear expectations, we always try to remember that students are going to need to hear us reinforcing the desired behavior, reminding about expectations, and redirecting when students need it. So, if, so when you're thinking about this at home, you're reinforcing your children when it's working and they're making good choices. You're reminding your children of what you all decided upon as norms if they forget. And you're redirecting your children to a better choice if the first two are not working so well. Finally, we talk a little bit about logical consequences because kids are going to make mistakes. 
when we talk about logical consequences at school, we talk about however, how the consequences should be directly related to the behavior. So a student wouldn't miss recess or eating lunch with friends unless the behavior was directly related to recess or being in the cafeteria. Taking highly desired activities away from students isn't a logical consequence, it's punishment. And the thing that we find about that is, is that it doesn't really prevent the behavior in the future long term because you're not building in any skill for the child to not repeat the behavior. So I often have to think on a case by case basis of the best consequences for students because I want to make sure I'm giving them an opportunity to skill build. The reason that they made a mistake is because they're lacking the skill in order to make the correct choice. So how am I going to build an opportunities for them to skill build? Happy to consult around logical consequences at any time. This activity called what's on your plate is an activity that I designed to help understand where behavior may be coming from and also to encourage positive thinking during this difficult time. And so this is a picture of my plate and I'm gonna go through each one of the activities that I did um, so that you can have an idea of how to do this in your own home. Everybody gets a white paper plate divided into four sections. The four categories are what's on my plate, things I need to do, what is my biggest worry, what are my silver linings, and what I want on my real plate. And as you're filling those out, I, I will share my plate with you so that you can see how I, I cut my plate up. You would not cut your plate up. I wanted to make it easier for you to see within the pictures. But I talk about Planning for Gibbs is on my plate, training Winnie my dog, making meals, sharing an office, trying to self-care, checking on my parents, missing my friends, getting ready for a new job. Those are all things on that section of the plate that I'm thinking about right now and trying to balance. Mrs. DeFrancisco's plate, silver linings. My silver linings right now are snuggles from Winnie the dog, calls with my best friends, waking, walking rather, all of Arlington, all of Arlington. I got AirPods, I am in love with them. I take them out, it feels like they're still in there, I'm wearing them so much. Learning to make ice cream, vlogging for parents, watching One Tree Hill with Allie and Zoe. Those are things that are helping me kind of get through this time. But I also have the biggest worry. I'm worried about my girls. Allie's in 11th grade and Zoe's in eighth. They miss their friends and they want to go back to school. And it hurts me to see them sad and worried. I'm trying to help Allie with her college search virtually and it's not the same for her. So that is my biggest worry. And what I actually have on my plate, which was very delicious, was I learned how to make a cauliflower pizza crust. So I try to be as gluten-free as I can. And so here's the recipe for that cauliflower pizza crust. Certainly can send you a more detailed one if you send me an email. Um, and I actually made this last week and it was my pick for one of our evening dinners. Then you can pass the plate. So you have your plate already constructed and you pass the plate, plate to the members of your family. Again, don't cut them up. That was just my way of showing them, showing you uh, a little bit better picture wise. Okay, read about what is on everyone's plate. Learn about what some of your children's worries are. Get ahead of the worries. Knowing what is worrying your child may very well help you address behaviors or even stop them before they show up. And in addition, them knowing about what you have on your plate is also going to be very helpful as you um, are working together and living together and learning together. So I hope this has helped you with a little bit of an idea here um, for an activity that can help you get some of those emotions out in the forefront and maybe prevent some of those behaviors uh, that you might be seeing during this uncharted water event here where we're trying to navigate our, our way through. So I appreciate you tuning in. Um, I certainly will be out with another vlog uh, midweek. Um, not sure what the topic is going to be yet. I am waiting for some information from the superintendent to do some updates. But for now, Kristen DeFrancisco, I hope you enjoyed this vlog. Thanks for watching.